This is the Digging Deeper podcast, where we engage in today's questions from a Christian perspective. Today I'm with Dr. Thomas McCuddy. He's the president of Families of Virtue and the director of Professional Studies and Apologetics at the Carolina College of Biblical Studies. Today we're talking about the good life. So say, say I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm like, you know, I, I see that there's lots of good things in life that I've experienced and I'm enjoying this and I've love that and I love food and I love music and whatever these, these, these things we can absorb that just make me happy and give me joy. And, and yeah, I recognize they don't last forever, but you know, I enjoy them and, oh, but this sounds sustainable. What is, what is the access road to this, to, you know, like to, to this virtue you're talking about? What is the point of, you know, I don't know about this God thing maybe. And I'm like, I want, I want that good. Like, how do I, how do I kind of test the waters? Where's the like, you know, the, the sample, the free samples, you know, how do I like see if this is going to last and this is all that it's promises. Cause that's some, those are some big promises. So right, like, right. and it's unlike everything else that I've experienced. Like I've had some really delicious meals and I've had some wonderful experiences with friends and, and then I remember them and I savor the memory and that's it. And everything I've experienced is like this finite joy. Mm-hmm. And so for someone to say, Hey, there's infinite joy and you know, and here it is. And so what, you know, how do you, how would you speak to someone who's kind of at that crossroads or at that, you know, lean? I think that for, uh, for most people, just like you said, we, we have many times these good memories and there's also this element, you know, the memories, they don't sustain, like, you know, at the end of my life, I hope when I look back, I have majority good memories, but you know, in the end, um, what really brings the satisfaction is again, not the memory. Like it's not the memory of food that fills, <laughs> you know, like I'm mm, always needing yeah. more food. And so, uh, when it, when it comes to, uh, as far as people chasing after this, I, I always like to point out the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, we have a guy who tried this and, you know, we always think, well, if I just had a little bit more, just had a little bit more. And I think what people experience, especially in America is very similar to what Solomon experienced where we do have everything, you know, that I can just pick up my phone and I can have anything delivered to me. You know, if I can't get it on Amazon, I get it from somewhere else. And and we we've almost reached this point where I think this is why as a society, we're starting to feel the emptiness. We're starting to recognize all of these things I'm chasing after. They are means to an end. They keep something else is out there each time. And mm-hmm. I think this is why we, we experience the emptiness. We, we start having you know, Why is it the case that in a society like ours, that as the world looks at us and says, you know, Americans, we, we have everything, you know, we, we're so prosperous. We have all this, but we have like this massively escalating uh, mental illness issue where people are so depressed and malcontent. Mm-hmm. And I really believe part of it is because because deep inside, we're starting to recognize through experience, this is not all there is. That, you mm. know, the, the next purchase will not solve what my soul truly longs for. And what your soul truly longs for can't be met with the physical. And, and that's mm. the mistake we're making. You, again, you can't solve a spiritual issue with physical things. And that's why I, w- I would maintain that when... Um, yeah, you know, we talk about with Jesus and the gospel, he pays for our sins. That is that is one joy, and that's a joy that lasts because those sins get paid for forever. So when we talk yeah. about uh, Jesus and the, and the gospel and that Jesus pays for our sins, that and, and that is joy, that is good. But that relationship that comes with God, that's what fulfills. That's what fulfills our spiritual need that all this physical stuff won't do, that all of these experiences these finite experiences cannot achieve. And I I compare it similarly to to like when I got married, that uh, when when I got married and you you go down there and and I was married when I was 20 years old, my wife was 19. And, you know, so we're young, we're just like, wow, we're married. And then I realized that 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 was just the start. Like, that's really cool, but you can't live at the altar. But that relationship Mm -hmm. I have now with my wife, that mm. is something, again, it's, it's not about the house we have. It's not about the car. It's not about the vacation. It's something immaterial and it satisfies in a way none of the material things do. So I think on a level, mm. most of us recognize we have something that cannot be met with stuff. And the, that deep-seated need, that's what 
Jesus fulfills. He get he he meets our need in being that we're in, we're indebted to God and He pays that debt. But He also meets that need because He brings us true life, a full life, and and the really the joy and the fulfillment we're looking for. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that example because that's yeah, that's really tangible. The idea of the length of that. Now I wonder. Um, I feel, and I've had conversations with friends like this where, where there's this, yeah, like we all recognize we want this good thing. We recognize that we have these kind of shadows of that, that, that even inform our desire and our hunger for the good, the good life and, and this, this, you know, this relationship. And then, and then we talk, where does, you know, can you break down like sin and like, you know, that's a word again, that a lot of people, this is a long conversation probably, but like, that's a word that a lot of people maybe hear who might be like, all right, I'm tracking with, I want this good thing. And you're telling me there is this good thing, but you're also telling me I, I'm in the way or there's something in the way that this guy took care of that I don't really get what that has to do with me just not just jumping on the train and being like, I do, and I want this, you know, good thing. Yeah. So I don't know if you could, you know, move over that speed bump for us and kind of break that down. <laughs> Well, and, and this is why the, the language of virtue really helps within Christianity, because that sin, whatever that, that wrong is, most of the time, the reason we sin is because we're practiced in it. And the sin is related to vice. So when we, we start looking at the vices and you look at things like gluttony, and you look at self-centeredness and you look at um, injustice, all those things, those are sins. But at the same time, mm. those are vices and we, we, we practice them. And the language of virtue and the concept of virtue shows us that if we are virtuous, this is how we were meant to be. I would maintain God has made us in his, in his image. So when we are virtuous, when we are, you know, good according to the way we've been made, when we're acting that way, when that's a part of our soul, that's why we're fulfilled. And this is why sin is so costly to us because sin and vice that actually is is not what we were made for. And even in the, the book of Jude, he talks about uh, those who had fallen into sin, they're more like animals. And mm. this is why even the whole idea of, of being civilized, civil, a civilized person is able to control their passions, control their desires. Why don't I punch my brother when I get mad at him? Well, because I'm civilized. Do I want to mm. punch him? Yes, that's the temptation. But because I'm civilized and I'm practiced in seeking the good, and I know that though punching him would satisfy an immediate desire, that it is not good, and the result would be actually it's, it's to my detriment. And so when we kind of link these ideas, that's why I want to behave good. That's why I want to do the good things is because mm -hmm. uh, the, the sin and the vice Again, that bears guilt, that creates problems just within my, even my own character. I mean, that's the whole point of why when we live the, the self-sacrificing life and we look at people who are self-sacrificing, and many times we're like, wow, you know, that, that takes something special. How do you do that? And it's because they are recognizing the good. They, they've sort of, uh, some of the language I use, they kind of lifted their eyes to higher things and they're not distracted mm -hmm. by the stuff down here. And that's the nature of sin. Paul talks about that in Colossians, where he says, you know, don't be so focused down here with this stuff because that's going to entrap and that's going to, you know, again, be the sins that, and especially as we as we indulge in them, we're going to be practiced in them. That's why with uh, my wife, when we first got married, you know, I was very self-centered. And actually my wife, I have to admit, civilized me in a huge way. I was kind of like a feral child. So um, <laughs> my wife showed me you know she was the one who was moral she was the one who was good and i it actually drew me to her like i grew up mm. in, in inner city memphis so you know i saw some things growing up and when i saw mm. her she showed me a good life she showed me something different and i i pursued that i wanted to be like her but i was so not like her i still had problems with self, the self-centeredness the lying you know i was i was manipulative uh, because I was good at it and I was practiced at it and I had mm. to practice the good. And then all of a sudden I'm looking back and I'm like, this is so much of a better existence. And it's better just naturally as a human being as we were created, but it's also better spiritually. And that my relationship with God, now I don't have all this sin 
that's in the way. I mean, Jesus paid for it, but I'm not indulging in it anymore. And mm. and again, there's that that sense of fulfillment that comes not from self righteousness. I don't look back and like, look at how good I am. It's uh, the sense of righteousness that I'm rightly aligned with God, and that feels mm. good and that's satisfying. Yeah. Would you go break down a little bit the practice of virtue? You you kind of talked about it, but and maybe even in light of your relationship with your wife mm-hmm. and how you saw that as a development and as a a practice. Right. So, in especially in discipleship, because that's what virtue is. It's a, it's a major tool for discipleship. So, mm-hmm. virtues are Now could you Go ahead. Sorry, real quick. Could you define what, what would, how would you define discipleship? Discipleship that is that is following becoming more like Christ. Okay, so in terms of Christian discipleship, all that entails, I would maintain, and and this is kind of what our our ministry has produced some discipleship material, after salvation, the first thing you should deal with is is virtue, because those deal with the vices, the ingrained habits that we have that make us not like Christ. You know, uh, Jesus Mm -hmm. was, I mean, we know he was virtuous. He had no vices. He had no sin. So that's why virtue is kind of like the first step in discipleship. And in order to to achieve that, virtue is taught, caught, and sought. Easy to remember. And I think with the church, we try to teach it, you know, here, do these right things. You know, we got to know mm. what the good is in, in whatever situation mm. or what should I do? Or that was the whole idea behind the, the WWJD movement. What would Jesus do? Because we figure if Jesus mm. would do it, then, then it's good. And that's why some people came along with flipping tables as an option. So didn't quite <laughs> So <laughs> we, we, we need to learn it and churches focus on that. But virtue also must be sought. There has to be, like, I have to desire. I, I, I remember even when I came to Christ, I wanted to be more like Christ. And, and my, my coming to Christ, by the way, like, I didn't go to church. Um, I actually went to a Christian school for, sa- again, inner city Memphis. I went for safety reasons. Mm. And um, I was exposed to Christ. I read the New Testament twice, and halfway through my eighth grade year, I accepted Christ in my bedroom, like just from reading the Bible. Mm. And so my mm. journey in Christianity is not like anyone else's. You know, no hymns, no youth group. You know, I had to call my grandmother up and said, you know, I, I need to go get baptized because I read the manual. Like, <laughs> you know, that, that's, <laughs> that was how I yeah. operated and yeah, um, awesome. so for me, I wanted to be like Christ, you know, so that that seeking, uh, I didn't quite know how, but I was I wanted to move in that direction because the way I accepted Christ was I said, if all this is true, there's no middle ground. I got to be all in. And my prayer that night, I told mm. I told God, I said, I'm all in like whatever that means. Mm. I don't know what it means, but I'm all in, you know. So first step, grandmother goes to church, call her. So you, I saw it. Yeah. And then I went to the church to be taught. But we also need examples. Virtue must be caught. We have to see it in action. So that's why when we read the stories, like when you look at the Old Testament narratives and you see, uh, you see the righteousness of Abraham, as the scripture talks about it, you see mm. these guys in action. You see what they do wrong, and those serve as counterexamples. That's where we begin to catch it. But we so desperately need it in the church. And I think many in the world kind of like sit back and they're like, Hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. Like you're all hypocrites. So much hypocrisy. And mm-hmm. and they're not wrong. We have a huge problem in living this out because I would maintain mm-hmm. because of the vices. And if we in the church had people who modeled it, then what they would be doing is what much like what Paul did. He said, Hey, look at me, I'm modeling, I'm following Christ, follow my way. And when we have those three things in place, that's how we begin to learn virtue. And, and to be honest, I teach on Wednesday nights, I teach little kids. I know I'm a college professor, but I got like eight, nine, 10 year olds that I'm working with. Mm. And we were we were talking about virtue one night and it was an eight year old who said, uh, yeah, but how do you get this? And I said, it's not through this lesson. It's not through the reading. You got to you have to practice it. You have to walk by faith. You don't learn to mm. walk by faith by reading about it. That's why I almost uh, kind of going back to one of your earlier earlier comments. There is that element. You, you don't learn to walk by faith unless you actually walk it. You can't just sit, kind of look at it and be like, OK, you know, I am now this thing. It, it doesn't happen. You have to mm. actually follow Christ. And that's why it's a daily dying to self. It's a daily doing this. I think a lot of people, you know, they they're because our culture trains us this way. They kind of jump in. It's like. Oh, ooh, this got hard. Okay, and we pop out. 
And mm. uh, I have my, my, I have these conversations with my students at the Bible college. And I tell them, you know, the, the other day, they just, it was just yesterday, one of my students, he said, uh, this book you gave us, this is hard. You know, and I said, good. And they're like, what do you mean good? Like, this is a lot of work. I was like, yes, <laughs> you will learn so much more because you have to mm. push through. You have to do this. And I told him, you're gaining intellectual virtue. You're gaining more virtue with stamina and steadfastness. You know, we use that word for, mm. from scripture. And he's like, oh, okay. And they, they said, this hurts. I was like, it does. <laughs> but the rewards, <laughs> yeah. the rewards, again, you can't put words to them. It is, it is something mm. that comes from that life of cultivating these things. And you get to enjoy that fruit of it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think uh do you think that virtue is something that the the culture wants? I think it really is because um and and part of it and and for the wrong reasons all the virtue signaling that goes on. Okay. Uh, mm. I I think there's this sense people want righteousness. They want which is the word for justice. I mean justice and righteousness go hand in hand. They want mm. good and this is what from Aristotle to Aquinas to the modern virtue writers point out, no human truly wants bad. What we have is misidentified goods, that we've taken mm. something that's bad and we think it's good. You know, the, the bank robber doesn't, doesn't rob banks just for the sake of robbing banks. He believes mm. getting that money is good and that this is the good means of doing it. And the bank robber is wrong. So mm. we all want good. We just have very different ideas of it and they clash and they conflict. And that's why we have this, this yeah. conflict in our culture. Uh, that's been always my points with politics. When it comes to politics, we're all seeking good. We just have very different ideas of what it is. Mm. And part of what we need to do, and I've also encouraged people, understand that when you're talking with somebody who differs and they, they've misidentified something as good, it's actually bad, you know, and they think it's good. Um, they might genuinely believe that. And that's why, mm -hmm. again, the, when I'm working with teenagers and they think that, you know, well, I'm just going to stick it to my mom and dad, you know, and, and they can't treat me like this because I'm the, they've misidentified the good. They, they believe their actions are good and righteous and justified. And part of what I've got to do is, is in not just, I mean, I do rebuke them for the wrong, but I also have to help show them you're not pursuing the good this is not what you think it is and mm. what, that's part of why we keep trying to like let's look at the source of good this would be god mm. jesus christ these are the ones who show us what a what not just goodness is but what the good life really is yeah yeah that's interesting and and especially with politics i think that's a common misconception in how to handle politics and that's that's the inflammatory way of you know of tribalism is like they want your down you know they want something like just because they're just evil like they right. just want something that will bring out everyone's worst and and it's always interesting and i am always fascinated by talking with someone who just disagrees with me and i'm like wow you i really respect your motivation like i think we have a sense of shared motivation for like let's make this a better culture a better decision and it always conversations like that always break down this idea that I held that, oh, like you're the enemy and you just absolutely want, you know. So how do you think, how do we engage, and this is kind of maybe an aside, but how do we engage in these kind of conversations with that sense of virtue and maybe even tying in this idea of, of motive versus method? And can we engage with someone whose motive and, and celebrate a motive where we disagree with a method or what is, what is conversing like that? with people interacting look like? Well, I think that, and, and I speak from experience because my, my little brother, he is a, he's a, a PhD in criminal justice. And mm. uh, so he's a college professor and, and his goal, part of criminal justice is how do you lower crime? So, you know, he and I have very different ideas as far as what that looks like. And, um, and so we have, we have the same kind of goal you know, like, and we, we have this conversation, he wants to lower crime, I think crime should be lowered. And so again, he goes at it, well, how do you legislate? How do you organize? And of course, I'm asking the question, well, what about the culture of the people? Do you have mm. in our country, you know, culture 
that promotes lawlessness. Like this goes back to vices. You know, are there vice so vices ingrained that it's producing criminals? And um, and of course, as as he says, you know, that's not a part of their equations. You know, they don't take that in consideration. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that uh, on one side, you know, as as I talk with him. I'm trying to bring this into the table. I'm trying to say there might be solutions you're not even considering. There might be things you, know, mm-hmm. you might need to look at this a different way. But then when it comes to others and you just completely, you know, disagree, what what is the you know, and this is especially among Christians when we were you know arguing over some sort of social issue. And um, I think what what happens is in that conversation, when you start arguing method you have to first identify what is the good so so i think virtue and this concept helps us step back because if you've got two different end goals and we're talking methods or we're talking laws we're talking you know the means to the end we're not talking about the same thing at that point we got to make sure first Mm -hmm. we we have the same concept of of good um Mm -hmm. this is why in in the case of the abortion debate that, uh, you know, and, and with Road versus Wade being overturned recently, I had a variety of conversations <laughs> about this issue. And mm, no know, doubt. The, and, and the end goal, I would say, well, is the preservation of life, the protection of the innocent. Like, can we agree? And many people would say, well, they switch over to women's rights. I was like, let we're talking about let's talk about the innocent first. And what I couldn't in, mm. in the conversations for most people, they weren't willing to talk about the same thing. They wanted to talk about something else. And so mm. I would never go further in the conversation because I'm like, we're not talking about the same thing. We need to make sure we're, we're discussing the same thing. We understand it the same way. Otherwise, we're, we're not actually having a discussion. We're just two people talking about two different things and we end up mad at each other. Um, yeah. But at the same token, it, it does, for some people, it brings a sense of appreciation when you start, you know, instead of not getting mad, and just kind of recognizing, I want what's good, and to recognize, okay, I know you want what's good. Let's try to come to terms mm-hmm. on that. And I think that really mm-hmm. solves a lot of the political issues, a lot of the, as far as the way discussion goes, you may not actually come to a solution. But to, mm-hmm. instead of, well, you just you 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 just hate babies, and you just hate women. It's like you're not getting anywhere. That's uh, that's mm-hmm. actually vice on both sides coming out. That's that's destructive. Yeah. 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 And I think you see that in in culture a lot is so much destruction is just in the way these discussions are being had, mm-hmm. not even, not necessarily, or I mean, not, yeah, just in the way discussions are being it, had. It's so. much easier to make fun of somebody. I know this isn't, again, when I was, I was uh, studying math in my undergrad, uh, many people would make fun, like math is stupid. It's always easier to make fun of what you don't understand or you don't like rather than actually dealing with it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think we have yeah, a lot of that yeah. in society right now. Yeah. Can you go back? I'd love to hear more about the good intentions aren't enough. Like, I feel like a lot of people would push back on that and say, well, you know, I really want, I, I have good intentions. And so why is that not enough if it doesn't, you know, why, like, why is good motive not enough? I don't know. Just I'd Right, right. It. Well, and the, the idea is you need good intentions. That's part of it. Because even if you have bad mm-hmm. intentions and you do good, there's a sense where, okay, so it's not really counting because it's like, well, you intend to do something bad and this good thing happened. I'm not going to praise you for that. <laughs> so in the same mm-hmm. way, if you have good intentions, but you end up doing bad, there's there's an element, I mean, there's a corruption there. And obviously it doesn't bear the same kind of guilt, like if you have bad intentions to do something, you know, bad, do something bad, you know, it's kind of like worst case scenario, but it's not good enough just like, um, You know, if we want to do good, like, let's say a doctor who intends to, you know, save a patient, you know, you know, well, I intended for it, you know, everybody keeps dying, but I'm intending. It's like, get the, you you need to let the people, you know, we need them to live, (laughs) you know, we need to actually Mm -hmm. achieve the good. And I think all those things work together. You need to have the right intention. You need to have, and virtue, the, the concept of virtue talks about this, that the right intention, the right method you know, the, the means doesn't justify the ends. Absolutely. The kind of the way like, well, you know, as long as I have a good goal, it doesn't matter how I get there. <laughs> yeah, it does. You need all these things in place. And that's when we, I would say, we truly become like Christ uh, because we're intending, we're moving the right direction and we're actually being like Christ. 
And and so that's why, again, the, the, the intentions are important, necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, my undergrads in mm. mathematics, we used to talk that way all the time. <laughs> so uh, it's intentions are necessary, but not sufficient. You need to actually okay. uh, strive towards what is actually good and, and try to achieve that. Yeah, I like that. And I like the example of a doctor whose intentions intention and method both really matter you yes. know you want a doctor with good intentions but you without the right method it's that's that's doesn't it's not enough right 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 yeah yeah that's really good well i, I like what you brought up about the like the good and what virtue is that that definition really is not what i would have guessed honestly virtue i would have thought morals and ethics would be like my first you know do the right thing which isn't what would you, i guess Break down the difference between maybe ethics and morals and virtue and how, how we define those differently or are there overlap? Uh, there is an overlap because I, I think the mistake we've made is, as believers, and I've experienced this as a pastor. So as a pastor and, I, and as a senior pastor preaching Sunday after Sunday, uh, and I specifically remember at a church, I was preaching simply be nice to people because in our congregation, a lot of people were related together, so related and they were, they were conflicts abounded. So my sermon mm. was literally be nice, okay? Re easy Christian yeah. sermon, just be nice to each other. And like, as soon as I got done preaching, uh, before I could even get to the back do, you know, at our church, the, the traditional handshake, we had people like crossing the pews, like ripping into each other for something that had happened. I think it was like a floral arrangement. I mean, it was something ridiculous. And I'm like, <laughs> knowing the good is not enough. And mm. it was, it was, it's more platonic. Plato and Socrates were the ones who said, if you know the good, you'll do the good. Uh, Aristotle was much more, if you know the good, you are able to do the good. So it's not just mm. about following the rules. And I think Christian ethics books are really written that way. They're like, here's the rules, here's the obligation, here's the duties that you have, now go do them. And kind of what I learned through, through ministry is, I mean, even though they know, they don't care. <laughs> they're not, mm. they're, they don't have, the, if you're not accustomed to doing the good and you're just accustomed to doing what is vice and, and wrong, then when they you, you hear something like, be nice, well, what if you're not a nice person? Jesus says, love your neighbor. And what happens if you're literally not a loving person and you've just practiced animosity and, and hatefulness? So we have these obligations, and this goes back to the, the fancy word is uh, deontological ethics, the duty-centered ethics. This again is what Kant and crew kind of like set up and where I think modern Christians really focus, you know, follow the rules. And those are important mm. and those are part of it. But on the other side, when it comes to morality, you know, we want to actually, you know, achieve good results, kind of like we're talking about. We want to actually do good. Mm. It's kind of like when you, uh, you know, if you, if you legalistically follow the rules and end up with bad results, like the Pharisees did that. I mean, they knew the law and they're like, Hey, don't break the mm. Sabbath. And Jesus is like, I'm going to heal this guy. And they're like, Oh, that's against the rules. And it's like, there's something mm. more to it. And, uh, I think virtue is what comes along, not as virtue ethics. And I know we don't have time to go into the hodgepodge that is there's a whole movement that really has kind of lost in the last 20, 30 years with virtue ethics. But I think they're almost like at the between the, the rules and the ends and the virtue, everything's sort of separated. And kind of what we teach is how to unify those, that God has a standard, he has rules, he has expectations. But at the same time, we want to achieve the good ends and virtue is what we habituate in our soul. That's the kind of people we become. So that way, when we know what is good and we see what is good, we know how, we're the kind of person who makes that happen. And I think those all work together. And honestly, I've been teaching ethics for a number of years. And when I read the books, no one talks about that. It's always mm. the system and the rules or, or taking situations. Like, what does a Christian do when they face this situation? And what does a Christian do when they face this situation? And I found that no matter if you lay out the whole game plan for every possible situation you can find, if you, don't, if, if you have habituated vices in your soul, then you're not going to do what you're supposed to do. You're not even going to mm. want to. And that's why uh, the, I would say the, the ethics teaches us what's right. And when you, you look at the ethics books and, and look at your duties, uh, the ethics books will show you, here's what you should do, but they, they will inform you, but they will not transform you. And mm. that's where virtue comes in. That's that transformation process that I think we're missing 
And that's why when it comes to Christian discipleship, there should be that, that union between this is what you should do and this is the kind of person you should be. So when you face these situations, mm. you do it. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Now, can we, I'd like to zoom out and have like a, a big entry point okay. for this conversation. And I love, I love the stuff we're talking about. So a big entry point would be like, is the good life possible? <laughs> and I think that really, that ties into a lot of what you're saying about virtue. Cause you've, you've kind of even pointed to that with like, this is just the best way to live your life and it's rewarding and it's fruitful. So like, is that possible? And how does that tie into virtue and, and is virtue a gateway into that? I, I believe so. And, it, and it's funny because it was just yesterday I saw a meme that said, uh, uh, it basically began with, they lied to you. They said money wouldn't make you happy. And now that I have secure income and I can go out to eat when I want to and I can do these things, you know, I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> so, so like uh -huh. literally just, just yesterday I saw this. And uh, everybody wants happiness. Everybody wants that, that good life. Uh, and the, the biggest problem we have is we don't have a way to identify that. And I, mm -hmm. I would maintain Christianity shows us that we have the source of good, who is God, because without God, it is all arbitrary at that point. And that, uh, you know, as I say, one one person's uh, trash is another person's treasure. The same thing would happen ethically that, you know, who are we to say that, you know, torturing is not good. And I, I would say God shows us these things are not good. And that when you pursue what is bad or you make your ultimate goal something that's lesser, then you're going to never truly be happy. So, uh, for example, the issue of money, uh, this is why money is a means to an end. Like I, I work and uh, the, the getting the money is the, the part of the goal, but that's not the only goal. Mm -hmm. Like if I get all the money and I get the money and, and most of us know this, like when we get paid and we look at, oh, OK, I got all this money. But then your next goal is, okay, how am I going to use this? You know, I need food, mm -hmm. rent, car, you know, whatever it is. But even uh, when you get the car, that's not enough. When you get the, you know, when you get the big house, because uh, I think it was um, uh, Tom Brady who was, uh, he, he was the one who left the NFL, came back in, and mm -hmm. uh, I, he was in an interview and he was, you know, he's got the, the multi, multi-million dollar house, literally married to a supermodel has more Super Bowl rings than I have rings in general. And <laughs> he says there has to be more. <laughs> like th this can't be it. So yeah. I think when it comes to to the good life, this is why virtue helps identify what is really satisfying. And it goes all the way back. Aristotle, the, the word that was used is uh, eudaimonia. It's a Greek word that's really hard to translate. We sometimes translate it as happiness. It's similar to what Jesus uses when uh, he talks about in the Beatitudes, blessed are, you know, that there's this sense mm. of blessedness, human flourishing. Everybody wants mm. that. And I think what happens is we keep misidentifying that. We keep getting distracted by other things. And I think virtue sort of puts us on the path that shows us what is truly good. The, the true, mm. uh, as Aquinas would say, the last end of man, you know, what is our real goal? And Aquinas goes through and just shows like all these other things. Is it some good here? Is it some created good? Is it this? And he knocks out everything. He says, God is that ultimate good. And that's why as everybody keeps running and, and they, they keep accumulating and they keep getting, they keep figuring out this isn't it. This doesn't mm. satisfy my needs. And uh, I think in some ways, Christianity holds the secret. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're holding on to what will meet your deepest ultimate need and actually fulfill you. And that's what we've got to communicate to people. Yeah. So you're saying that God is like the framework for us understanding what is good and wrong and, you know, right. What is good and bad? Cause we want the good life. That means there's a bad life and there's a bad path that we don't want to take. Um, and then also, are you saying also that God is like, he's also the end of that path. It's not just, these this ethical code that if you execute it you will be even you know ethically satisfied it's it's that there's more than that right could you break that down if that's kind of where you're, where you're going with right it? and and this is where between you know whether it's Aquinas or C.S. Lewis there's the idea we, we all have desires we all want and the problem with our appetites is whenever they're satisfied it doesn't last we you know we get full but we want more food you know we're happy we're entertained but later we're bored and 
God is the source of good, he shows us how we should live and move and what the right things are to do. But he also serves as that ultimate goal, that when we have God, we are totally fulfilled. And that, um, and this is why in theology, the idea is when we see God, our appetites will actually be satisfied. We won't mm. want anything else because we will have had the greatest thing that we could ever have. You know, it's kind of like when you, uh, you know, almost the idea, like if you eat the really big meal, the idea is, okay, I'm not going to eat the rest of the day. I'm not going to be hungry for a long time, but it wears off. The idea is that mm. God in his perfection, when we actually get to see him, as John tells us in his epistle, when we see him, we get to see him as he is. That's when, again, we will have total fulfillment. And that's why as we, we chase after other things, we're not going to get that fulfillment. And even as if we choose to chase the wrong way, if we're doing the wrong things, there's always that sense of dissatisfaction. Like you, you notice that with people who are doing wrong, it's that sense of guilt, that sense of this, it really shouldn't be this way. And sometimes we can sear our conscience in that sense so we can just kind of keep functioning. But deep inside, we, we know it's like, this is not it. There has to be more. And that more is God. That's what we really need to mm. point to. Covered a lot. I don't know if there's anything, do you have anything more to share on virtue and the good life? I think that uh, the one thing I'd like to, to mention, uh, especially as it relates with like Christian apologetics, because my doctorate is in Christian apologetics. And so a lot of people like, you know, what, what, what's the, they think that I've gone like another route with virtue. And I said, uh, I actually give a talk at, at uh, the International Society of Christian Apologists about the concept of virtuous apologetics, that with uh, Christian apologists and the seeking of intellectual virtue and the feeding of the mind, that it is, it's insufficient. And uh, again, necessary, but insufficient. It's the era of Solomon. Solomon, who was the wisest man next to Jesus Christ who ever lived, but you look at the way he lived. And that's because he he had the, the morality that was not dealt with. You know, he, he was led away by his desires. And so as it pertains to the truth of Christianity, I think this is why in, in our in our ministry, if you were to look at our, our ministry, we have what we call our teaching tree. And we specifically designed it where the roots are faith, hope and love, because that's what nourishes it. But the tree itself is an intertwined uh, trunk with intellectual, the intellect and morality. And that's why when it comes to the Christian life, whether it's apologetics, theology, or even just, you know, humanitarian missions, whatever it is, we need to recognize that we need to, to have the Christian mind and the Christian life. These two are, are necessarily intertwined. And that's how we're going to produce a, a genuine fruit without being out of balance or what happens like with the Christian apologists, they tend to, they, they're accused of being out of touch. I know this because I was that way for a while. I sat in the ivory tower and I look around and I was like, hmm, look at look at all the 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 un the uneducated, look at them. And all of a sudden I realized, no, that that's not that's not what Jesus had in mind. And that's when that that's the main reason why I stuck with youth ministry for so long. My favorite were middle schoolers. You know, nobody wants to play the middle schoolers, you know, they're they're <laughs> they're difficult to deal with. You know, they're uncivilized, all those things. But I loved them and I loved being with them because there was a genuineness and it kept me grounded. And that's kind of uh, the encouragement. And another side of our ministry is that for those who are getting uh, sort of carried away, virtue, when it's a total package, keeps us grounded, keeps our feet on the ground so we can genuinely walk in that faith with solid footsteps. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Thomas. Be sure to follow and subscribe for new episodes every Wednesday.